There are a lot of factions in Immortal Empires. If you own all three games and the DLC, you're looking at over 80 lords across 23 unique factions. And for the most part, every single one of them has a unique playstyle that you need to pick up on as you play their campaign. To make things easier for everyone, I thought I'd make this video where I'm going to go through every single faction and legendary lord and give you a little bit of info about them and their playstyle, both in campaign and battle, so you can easily choose who to play first. Just before we enter factions and lords though, a big thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. If you've somehow been living under a rock and haven't heard of Skillshare, let me break it down for you. It is the online learning community where you can find thousands of classes to either learn a new skill or refine an old one. They've got classes for photo, video editing, creative writing, and even leadership and management. There is a whole host of skills that you can learn here. One class I've been enjoying this month is Filmmaking for All by Dan Mace. Now, I know these videos are hardly films, though judging by the length of this one, it could be a feature length film. But this class isn't really about making films, it's just about making videos and the storytelling aspect of that and how you can weave it in to make better content. The class goes into the seven types of stories that can be told, how you can make them compelling all the way from preparation to execution and of course editing. And of course if that isn't for you, there are still many more classes out there so there's definitely something that you can enjoy. If you need any more reasons to try Skillshare, it's completely ad free, there are new classes added every single week and there are subtitles for French, Spanish, Portuguese and German. If this sounds like something you'd like to try then head on down to the description and the first 1000 people to click the link will get one month free of Skillshare. Huge thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the video and supporting the channel, really do Appreciate it. Now, let's get into these factions. Oh, come on, you don't look at did you just superhero cow just did a split for you. That was very impressive. First up, the Beastmen. They used to be the laughing stock of the Warhammer world, but ever since their rework, they've been tearing up lands across the globe no matter who stands in their way. Immortal Empires is no different. The new factions have simply provided them with more targets to turn their attention to for mass devastation. Their playstyle and campaign is all about constant battling to empower bloodstones and use your momentum to push your faction to higher and higher levels of power. In battle, they keep up that aggression with a roster rivaled by few with its ability to get on top of the enemy as quickly as possible and wipe them out with animalistic ferocity. As for your lord choices, you can't go wrong with Kazrak. Yes, he does have just the one eye, but he's still a fearsome faction leader, giving his armies many abilities to help them slip around the map unnoticed by most. Maligold the Dark Omen is more magically gifted and prefers to use this to his advantage, as well as generally being a shit guy to be around. Morgo the Shadow Gave is the beastman that's embraced their chaotic roots the most, as you can tell by his appearance and army preference. And finally, you have the most cracked lord to be in a Warhammer game so far, Torox the Brass Bull. If Total Rampage and Momentum are your thing, then go right ahead. Lord Lou and Leonker. Seigneur Lou and Leonker. Britonia. Now onto a laughing stock of a different type. Britonia have never been the worst faction in the game, but boy, are they a weird one. From their extremely over the top French accents to their obsessive simping for the lady, the Brets have an uphill battle to earn your respect. Their campaign is all about chivalry, so you'll be performing noble actions such as keeping your population happy, not raising the homes of your enemies, and of course, donating to your favourite e-girls on Twitch to build this up. Doing so will net you all sorts of bonuses to boost your faction in power. You'll also need to manage your peasants to ensure your economy stays afloat, and complete side quests to allow your lords to use the entire roster. Speaking of the roster, it's a mix of Cav, 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 and of course, a little bit of Cav alongside a handful of other units. If you hadn't guessed, their battle playstyle is massively micro-intensive, so those looking for chill battles should probably go elsewhere. But if you can master this menagerie of horses, you'll get a lot of value indeed. As for the faction leaders, first up you have Lord Luan Leon Kerr, who is basically the chosen one of the lady, so he's great at cleansing the impure and chaotic from this world. Alberic de Bordelot, who's gone on holiday to Lustria, so will be fighting for his bloody life. Fae Enchantress, who is the e-girl every Bretonian dreams of, so has peasants flowing to serve her, and Joan of Arc, sorry, Rapon Stilioness, who's determined to bring chivalry to the deserts of the south. I'm used to buying my critters pre-made. How does your store differ? Why should I tell you when we've got a video that shows you? Revel in this common slaughter! The Demons of Chaos, despite literally everyone saying it should be otherwise, Daniel is still the only lord for the Demons of Chaos, and talking about them without talking about him would make for a pretty short segment. If you can't decide which branch of Chaos you want to play as and instead want to use all of them at once, then look no further than here. Daniel can make use of all four rosters of Chaos as well as undivided units and can use some diet versions of their mechanics, such as Plagues and Bloodletting. This offers an incredibly versatile gameplay that can be done differently every single time you load up a new save. The main draw of this faction, however, is Daniel himself, and this may be the reason why we have not and may never get a second lord for this faction. He's the first lord in a Total War Warhammer game who can be totally customised, all the way from his name to how he looks by making use of the demonic gifts. This allows you to add different parts to him until you have the perfect demon for you, whether that be dedicated to one of the four branches or totally undivided. <laughs> The 
Dark Elves have seen some changes in Immortal Empires, so you can no longer farm rebellions to max out your slaves and have 20k income by turn 3. Instead, they are now a currency that can be spent on diktats in a province to boost it in a variety of ways. Alongside slavery, they also have access to Black Arcs, which are powerful naval vessels that allow them to rule the waves even more so with the new sea lanes. These can work as mobile support and recruitment hubs, or just stupid powerful naval-only armies. There isn't really a bad way to use them, other than to not use them. In Battle of the Dark Elves rely on an aggressive playstyle with high damage infantry and monsters, combined with skirmishing range troops and devastatingly unique cav units. For your lord choices you have the edgelord supreme Malekith, who is immune to your mum jokes since he quite literally has been there and done that. He also is the de facto leader of the Dark Elves so can bring them together better than anyone else. Mommy Marathi is literally his mommy, an ex side piece of Anarian himself. She's also somewhat of a Slaneshi sorceress, so sure does love making use of all that. Crone Helbron is the oldest of the Hag Queens and adores capturing as many slaves as possible and making full use of them in Death Knights. Deadly parties that enhance her faction in many ways. Loke Felhart is a Dark Elf cosplaying as a pirate and has found his way to the opposite end of the globe to his countrymen. He's your guy if your plan is to use as many Black Arcs as possible and utilize those naval infantry troops. Malice Darkblade is that one girl he went to high school with that had all those personalities, but he has it for real. He's constantly fighting the possession of the demon Zarkan, who changes Malice from a firm leader to a chaotic war crimes machine. And finally, Rakarth is the Dark Elf you if you're really into Pokemon, since he's a high beastmaster and loves collecting monsters from the world over and bending them to his will in battle. Wait for me, I got little legs! <laughs> the Dowie have always been a bit of a slow playing faction, and not much has changed here. They still boast one of the most powerful economies in the game, with their ability to make millions of gold if you build your provinces right. They still remember every bit of wrongdoing done against them and must avenge it no matter the cost and they still love using those underways to navigate the hellish mountains they call home. In battle, they maintain that slowness with a roster full of immovable front lines, literal storms of ranged firepower, and a healthy dose of half-naked men dual-wielding axes. The first of our lords here is Thorgrim Grudgebearer, who is currently poring over the Great Book, just itching for a chance to clear it. He's also High King of All Dwarves, so can get them all on side and keep them there. Ungrim Ironfist, the Slayer King, is of course King of the Slayers, and can feel them much easier and push them to their highest potential of any of the Dwarf Lords. Belagar Ironhammer is the rightful ruler of Karak Eight Peaks and will spend the start of every campaign making the deadly pilgrimage to retake it with the help of his ancestral heroes. Grom Brindle, the White Dwarf, has been finally granted his own faction and is now taking the fight to the Knife in the Northwest. He will use the power of the Ancestor Gods to buff his faction to new heights in his quest to right some ancient wrongs. Finally, we have Thoric Ironbrow, the legendary Rune Lord. His campaign is a little bit different to the others as he works to reclaim lost Dowie relics to empower himself and his faction. <laughs> summon the summon the summon the Alex account summon the Alex account the Alex account. The Alex account If you haven't heard of the empire you must have been living under a rock since they are the Total War Warhammer faction and pretty much the face of the series I'm not really sure why, since they are the least creative faction in my opinion, but I digress. They're still a lot of fun with their Imperial authority and elect count system, allowing them to quite literally unite the Empire under one banner and control a massive amount of land to fuel your conquest or simply defend your home. In battle, they have the most well-rounded of any roster with decent units in nearly every single category. They have good front lines, ranged, artillery, cav, and even magic. The only thing they do lack is any monsters, but you can't have everything. For our lords, we have the man himself and literally the wielder of the Warhammer, Karl Franz. He's the true emperor of the empire and can unite them at speed you have to see to believe, and inspires dedication like no other in his armies. Balthazar Gelt is the supreme wizard of the empire and can make use of their spellcasters better than anyone else, as well as enjoying a good bit of artillery. Marcus Wolfhart is manning the empire's expedition into Lustria, which is a bit less of a royal rumble these days, but nevertheless an inhospitable environment for one such as he. You must make the most of limited recruitments and shipments from the Empire to establish a forward base in the New World. And finally, we have Volkmar the Bald, I mean Grim. He's broken off from Kal to collect the books of Nagash and seal them away where others would seek to exploit them. Being the head of the Cult of Sigma, you can also make use of its followers in ways other lords could only dream of. I Dude, I WANNA JERK OFF! FUCK! I WANNA JERK OFF! LOOK AT THIS! Grand Cathay are of course the most Eastern inspired of all the factions and boast fitting mechanics for this title. Their empire runs on harmony to keep things balanced and optimised. Maintain this balance and you will be rewarded. Tip the scales and you will regret it. They're also a trade hub, with caravans travelling the world to net them increasing amounts of cash the longer and more dangerous the journey. And finally, they can use their magical Wujin compass to direct their faction in one of four focuses. In combat, they have one of the most ranged focused armies in the game, with only a handful of front lines units, with many powerful ranged infantry and artillery. They also have a couple of powerful constructs, alongside some excellent cavalry, and of course, a couple of decent spellcasters. 
We have two Lord choices here. First up, we have Miao Ying, and aside from being the target of some vomit-inducing mods and fan art, she's the cold and aloof leader of the Northern Provinces and defender of the Great Bastion. She has everything she needs to keep Chaos out of Cathay, so make sure she does, or prepare to witness your empire burn. Our other choice is Zhao Ming, in control of the Western Provinces. He's the trading superstar of Cathay, with his easy access to the Ivory Road, so cash will never be a problem. Say ah! Oh. Say ah! <laughs> Say ah! <laughs> the Greenskins are somewhat of a predecessor to the Beastmen, with their total disregard for self-preservation and preference for constant battling, but have since moved to a much more of a calculated playstyle. Once they've got enough momentum on their side, they can call a while on a specific faction and settlement, and every single army in their faction will double in size with various units depending on your lord, level and location. These will last for the full duration of the war, and more often than not, will allow you to be successful and head right into the next one. They can also use the underways just like the dwarves, just make sure you don't meet each other underground as that can tend to get a little bit awkward. In combat they are all about that aggression, most of it is in melee with a ton of melee infantry monsters, cav and chariots that want nothing more than to dive headfirst into the enemy. They do have ranged units, but only a couple of them are really any good, and clearly aren't the focus of the playstyle. The first of our Lord choices is Grimgor Ironhide, the biggest and the baddest of the Black Orcs. Nothing pleases this guy more than fighting, and if he can do it alongside his fellow Black Orcs, even better. As Hag the Slaughterer is the only Orc with the power of the Law of Death, and as such can build something of a friendship with the nearby vampires whilst burning the Empire to the ground. Skarsnik is the greenskin equivalent to Belgar from the Dwarves, since every greenskin believes it's his rightful place to rule, but he's going to have to take it himself if he wants it. Wurzlag is the leader of the Savage Orcs of the Badlands, and can tame their wild thirst for battle and use it to his own advantage and push them to their full potential. And finally we have Grom who is the fattest of all greenskins, actually an oversized goblin who ate some regenerating troll meat. He seeks nothing more than to collect ingredients from around the globe to make the tastiest feast he possibly can and use it to fuel an attack on the High Elves. <laughs> <laughs> the High Elves are just a little bit snooty and live for high society, and while that combo can be nauseating, it does make for a pretty strong faction. They can collect influence which can be spent on better lords and heroes, as well as manipulation of diplomacy between two factions. They can also make better use of outposts than most factions and will likely be leading the charge of the Order Tide for the late game. In combat they rely on training and will benefit when at high HP from their martial prowess. They have an excellent selection of melee and ranged infantry, as well as cav, with some of the most powerful units in the game in this selection. They also have a handful of monsters and artillery pieces, which may not be the main attraction, but are still plenty powerful. For our legendary lords, first up we have Tyrion, heir of Anarion, and the de facto leader of the High Elves. Chances are with this guy, you'll be uniting Ulthuan under your control and preparing to defend it from Dark Elves and more once you're all done. Teclis, brother of Tyrion, is the weaker physically, but boasts a massive magical knowledge and power. He'll make much better use of the faction's selection of mages, as well as some of the most dedicated of units. Alariel the Radiant is the antidote to chaos, and she will focus on cleansing it wherever she goes. Quite like Tyrion, she also seeks to unite Ulthuan under High Elf control, and do whatever is necessary to do so. Lifanar is an elf focused on taking the fight to the Dark Elves. He seeks to hunt down and destroy any and all Druki, and will use whatever sneaky means he can to achieve this. Elfarion the Grim has his sights set on the Greenskin Scourge, so has taken an expedition to the Badlands to seek them out and wipe them from the earth. Alongside this, he must also maintain Tor of Res and the dungeons of Athel Tamara to keep Ulthuan safe and complete his quest. And finally, Imric the Dovahkiin has set out on a quest far from Ulthuan to track down mighty dragons and tame them to restore Kaldor to its former glory. I have contained my rage for as long as possible, but I shall unleash my fury upon you like the crashing of a thousand waves! Be gone, vile man! Be gone from me! A starter car! This car is a finisher car! A transporter of gods! The Golden God! I am untethered and my rage knows no bounds! Khorne clings to the coattails of Torox by stealing his ability to fight multiple times in the same turn, as long as you keep winning. Alongside this, they do of course love to collect skulls, which can be spent on decorating new settlements and adding to the ever-growing skull throne for some massive faction bonuses. And finally, they have a unique method of expansion, where they take one settlement and raise the rest in a province, and over time, the empty settlements will become theirs, which can be pretty stupid powerful for expansion. On the battlefield, Khorne is of course no holds barred, attacking the enemy as fast and hard as you can. They have little concern for defence, with their only saving grace being resistances on demons and a handful of armoured units. They also only have one ranged unit, but it's a beast and can launch skulls of the enemy forever if you use it right. They only have the one lord for now, and that's Scarbrand. His rage knows no bounds and allows him to roam it continuously and fight until the end of time, as long as you don't lose. Two minutes later, the bear was spotted behind this home in Moreland Hills. 
This recreation identifies how witnesses say the bear escaped into the woods. Kislev are the wall that keeps the world safe from the horrors and the chaos wastes. But whereas Cathay have a natural wall, Kislev have snow and ice, and of course, bears. They have deep connections to their motherland and the deities within it, and can invoke the power of these deities to assist you in your journey. There's also a fierce political battle going on between Katrin and Kostaltin for leadership of Kislev, which ensuring you win will be the key to your campaign. They also have a unique system of settlement leadership, with Ottomans each controlling a province and providing it with a variety of buffs and effects. Finally, they also have a rigorous training program for their Ice and Tempest casters that sees them taking much longer to recruit, but being a lot more powerful once they are on the field. In Bal Kislev have a powerful mix of hybrid weapons units, grizzly monsters and cataclysmic casters that sees them able to take on many foes with a fairly adaptable playstyle. As for your lore choices, you have the Ice Queen Sarina Katerin, who is the widely accepted leader of Kislev and daughter of Big Boris Ursus. As Ice Queen, she makes much better use of Frost Maidens and other cool units. Gestaltin, the Supreme Patriarch, is extremely devoted to the Kislev faith and seeks to take full control using his own Patriarch heroes and the common men and women of Kislev. And finally, the big guy himself, who you might not see if you haven't unlocked him yet, Boris Ursus. He's taken the fight to chaos with his army of bears and stands firm in the face of corruption. The Lizardmen are of course one of the most visually impressive factions in the game and are also the current leader of most legendary lords in a single faction, though once the Champions of Chaos drop, that's going to be a tie. The faction mechanics are a little bit basic since they haven't seen a proper rework since pretty much the launch, but that doesn't mean they aren't a lot of fun. Their geomantic web rewards you for creating a network of connected settlements that all focus on the same commandments to empower their effects. You also gain access to special blessed spawnings via missions and events, which connect you access to some later game and more powerful units earlier in your campaign. In battle, they have a massive roster to choose from with incredibly tough melee infantry, sneaky skirmishers, a decent selection of casters, and plenty of monstrous units, big and small, for any occasion, including some of artillery strapped to their back. For your legendary lords, first up, you can't go wrong with the Slan, the Myth, the Legend, Chunky Boy, Master Mundi. Not only is he the sexiest legendary lord, he's also an outstanding caster, better than ever before, now he's on the big map. Krotgar isn't as magically gifted and instead focuses on training the best possible Soros leaders he can, resulting in some extremely powerful heroes. Tenowin is the most religious of the lizards and is on a quest to fulfill the prophecy of Sotek. He'll be forced to utilize skinks until he progresses on this quest or face extreme economic penalties. Tic-Tac-Toe is the air superiority leader of the lizards. He's always on his pterodon mounts and pushes flyers in his faction to their absolute limits whilst zooming around the map at breakneck speeds. Gorok is the easiest lord you could hope for. He's an outstanding tanky fighter, makes his units tougher just by existing, and starts with Lord Croak, who is one of the most broken casters in the game. Akai is still lost and wandering the earth and has found himself on the exact opposite end of the world to his homeland in Lustria, where he hopes to cleanse wrongdoers with his unique hard gameplay and Croxagor focus. And finally we have Oxyotl, the sneaky skink specialist who pushes the aforementioned units more than anyone else and spends his time teleporting around the map to squash chaos threats as they arrive. We seek the monsters that you fear the most. <laughs> Norsk have had a light rework since their Wamp 2 days, but still have more changes to come over the next few years of content. As it stands at the moment, they have a strong focus on pillaging the coastlines of the Empire and Bretonia and expanding into their territory to gain a foothold in hostile lands. They can ally themselves with one of the four Dark Gods and reap increasing bonuses for their level of dedication. They can also embark on monster hunts to gain legendary items and units to aid them in their quest for destruction. Their roster in battle is highly aggressive and boasts a combination of monsters and monster hunters with several skirmishing troops excellent at whittling down large targets combined with monsters of all shapes and sizes to suit any situation. If you're lords here, you have two choices. Wolfric the Wanderer might be a little bit basic right out the gate with his Marauder focus, but later in the game he becomes a mammoth riding maniac capable of taking out entire armies by himself. Alternatively, you can go for Throg, the Troll King, who unsurprisingly has a focus on troll units and taking them from decent mid-game units to pretty strong late-game monsters that can take a surprising amount of punishment. Do you smell it? That smell. A kind of smelly smell. A smelly smell that smells. Smelly. Ah, Nurgle, the Scourge of 2020, back at it again with that plate crafting. Only playing them is a lot more fun than, well, that stuff was. Plate crafting allows you to add symptoms and aspects to send out into the world for your benefit and your enemy's detriment. Alongside this, Nurgle has a unique method of building and recruiting with these cyclical buildings that move through different states as the turns go on. 
Some of these add units to your recruitment pool, which can then be instantly added to your armies at low HP. Their roster is one of the slower and less obvious ones in the game, with lots of units with low speed but high HP, meaning you may not wipe out enemies instantly, but eventually they'll probably run out of HP before you do. They have some great front lines, as well as of course a ton of powerful monsters, and very little ranged. Nurgle also only has one lord at the moment, in the form of Kugath Plaguefather. He's on a quest to craft the perfect plague and spread it to the entire world, and he doesn't care how many Nurglings he has to consume to do it. When I grew up, I want to be a lardo on workman's comp just like dad. I wash myself with a rag on a stick. Thogas are of course one of the most anticipated factions to be added to the series, and their entrance does not disappoint. They are positively stuffed with mechanics fitting of their reputation. They do use settlements, but can also form camps which house their most elite recruitment buildings and function as hubs to be placed strategically across the map. Meat must also be sourced to keep your ogres fed and happy, as well as for using sacrifices to the Great Maw for great bonuses. Being the mercs of the Warmer World, they also get contracts coming their way, which can be completed with coin and more, and finally their characters can complete certain actions to unlock big names, which grant them new titles as well as new buffs and bonuses. Their rust consists of a ton of large units with only a handful being small sized. This results in armies with very low numbers, meaning you have to use their physical size to make up for the lack of men in the field in a very fast paced playstyle. For their legendary lords, you first have Greece's Goldtooth, the richest and fattest of the ogres, as well as the current Over Tyrant. This grants him improved relations with other ogre tribes, as well as many economic bonuses. Or you can go for Scrag the Slaughterer, the crazed butcher, with an affinity for gorges of the mountains of Bourne. He buffs butchers and his pets in massive ways, which make for a more than viable alternate playstyle. Cheese. The Skaven are of course the original cheese faction and they are finally back in the game and good news is that most of them have hardly changed at all. They can still create secret networks of undercities to sneakily screw over whoever they please. They still have to keep on top of food to keep the clan performing at peak efficiency and they still spread that Skaven corruption wherever they go even though they hate it but tolerate due to the clan rats it spawns in battles. Their battle strategy can go a number of ways due to their impressive roster with some decent front lines, a bunch of the most broken ranged units in the game and a healthy dose of monsters. Here you have six choices of legendary lords and these are some of the most different you will see in the same faction. Queek is the most straightforward of the bunch. He's a fierce battler that wants to take control of the mountains and badlands of the middle of the map, but not if it means he has to work with magical seers. Lord Skrulk is the most Nurgle aligned of the rats and he loves a good plague and receives benefits when his armies or settlements are infected. He also makes full use of plague units and mechanics like no other lord. Honestly, still not sure how Tretch is a legendary lord since his entire gimmick is running away. He's the epitome of Trixie Rat with his buffs whenever he breaks a treaty or retreats from a battle challenge. Ikit Claw is one of the most busted lords in the game for two reasons, his massive buff for Skaven weapons teams and the Forbidden Workshop which buffs them, himself, multiple other units and can also craft literal nukes. He's wacky. Deathmaster Snitch has another unique playstyle with his Hitman approach to gameplay, where he takes contracts from the other Skaven clans to unlock units, items and more upon completion whilst relying on his sneaky units and heroes. And finally throughout the Unclean, the mad scientist of Hellpit who experiments on any unit he can get his hands on and turns them from regular units into monstrous beasts, whether for better or worse. I do not wish to be horny anymore. I just want to be happy. Slanesh is of course the most seductive of factions and as such attracts a lot of followers known as devotees. These devotees allow you to spread cults throughout the world and buff your provinces in a mechanic similar to the Dark Elf Diktats. They can also use these devotees to summon disciple armies to follow and assist you in battles for a limited time. And finally seduction allows them to bring units from the enemy's side to yours during battles and force entire factions into vassalage if you work them hard enough. Their roster is focused on speed, to stay on the move constantly and make as much use of charge bonus as you can. If units are stood around a Slanesh, you're probably doing something wrong, so bring plenty of Cav and Chariots and keep them moving. Only one legendary lord here so far, and that's Nakari. He's a seduction specialist, allowing him to make excellent use of allies, vassals and outposts to spread his touch through the world with ease and tempt even the most resolute to his cause. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. The Tomb Kings have changed little since their addition all those years ago. They still enjoy collecting canopic jars to spend in the mortuary cult to unlock powerful items, units and bonuses. They still have their recruitment system of limited lords locked behind research dynasties and free recruitments based on capacity. And they still enjoy the buffs from the Realm of Souls, which provides them with healing and backup after taking enough damage in battle. Their roster is full of plenty of skeletons for front lines and a ranged unit or two, but their best units are of course the Constructs, which are massive beasts held together with magic and stone, set on tearing the battlefield apart. If you're looking for a legendary
Legendary Lord, then Cetra is a great choice. He inspires fast growth in his faction, which makes for easier expansion and replenishments. Just don't ask him to pass you a drink or anything, because, well... Does not serve. Grand Hero Fan Katep has found himself still as far from his homeland of the deserts of the south, and is instead nestled in the Red Desert in the far west. He makes best use of casters and crafting of all lords, but honestly, he isn't the best. High Queen Kalida is the most sociable of the lords here and has an easier time making friends with others as well as keeping her populace in line. On top of this, she empowers ranged units and inflicts poison on all her army faces, which is pretty top tier. And finally, we have Arkan the Black, who is hated by pretty much all the Tomb Kings, but can be much more buddy-buddy with vampires, whether coast or count, as well as making use of a couple of their units. Our final of the four Monogod factions, Sinch is quite the tricksy faction to play as or against. Their changing of the ways sees them manipulate the world and factions in it to their benefit and do almost whatever you want. They also have near total control over the winds of magic and can funnel it in and out of their lands to empower the armies and settlements whilst weakening any intruders. And finally, they can make use of the teleportation battle stands to navigate the map with ease at the cost of a little bit of magic. In battle, the magical focus continues with extremely powerful casters, plenty of missile units, monsters and more, all under the protection of the magical regenerating barrier of Siege. At the moment, it's just Kairos for Legendary Lords, but his sight of the future and past grants him massive buffs to his own heroes and debuffs to enemies, alongside some items to enhance his magical power. That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem. The vampires are perhaps the best themed of any faction in Warhammer history. Every single thing about them just screams pirate and I absolutely love it. Their legendary lords build reputations for themselves as they perform piracy actions which allow them to climb the infamy ladder and take on other pirates for booty and verses of a legendary shanty. They can make use of pirate coves, secret under settlements that allow them to siphon wealth from the host settlement and on the battlefield they bring an unbelievable amount of gunpowder combined with a set of salty monsters ready to tear landlubbers limb from limb. Their first choice of legendary lords is the crazy but not stupid Luther Harkon. He's taken to the Lustrian coastline, much to the chagrin of the natives, and seeks to wipe them out and secure himself a base of operations to plunder nearby shorelines. Count Noctilus is another extremely powerful, bordering on overpowered lord, with his affinity for Necrofex Colossus units, aka giant behemoths made from ship parts with a cannon for an arm. Aranus Assault Spite is the treasure hunter of the four, with her increased chance of finding treasure maps and better rewards for sacking and raiding. She's also the most human option, so can make use of some limited human units. And finally, Silostria Diophan, who is basically Dawn French from Harry Potter. Being a ghost herself, she can make excellent use of other ethereal units, as well as a unique paladin hero. Vampire Counts, my favourite faction in the game, and the first guide coming for Immortal Empires dropping just an hour after this video. They're another stellar bit of theming, and their simpler mechanics fit excellently with their aesthetic. They have the ability to raise dead to instantly recruit units to their armies in a pinch. This can also be enhanced when you use it in the sight of a major battle to net you some much later game units. They also love to spread their vampiric corruption wherever they go, to the detriment of most other factions and the delight of themselves. And finally, you can call upon the ancient bloodlines to recruit semi-legendary lords to your faction, with unique skill trees alongside powerful effects just for existing. Their roster is another that really focuses on that all-out rush to take on the enemy, up close and personal, as fast as possible. They lack any plentiful ranged units, so are forced to move up on the enemy with their combination of melee infantry, cav and monsters, both in the air and on the ground, all while being propped up by the magnificent healing and damage of the Lore of the Vampires. Our first lord is Manfred von Baldstein, who's moved from Castle Drakenhof to the deserts of the south in search of the books of Nagash to enhance his necromantic powers. There are few that can rival his magical prowess already, so who knows what powers he'll unlock once he has them all. Heinrich Kemmler is one of the most powerful necromancers of all time, partly due to an old deal with the Chaos Gods. As a result, he can work well with the forces of Chaos and is a terror to face, especially if he has some necromancers and the winds of magic on his side. Vlad von Karstein has returned to rule over Castle Drakenhof alongside his darling love Isabella, where they now set their sights upon the pathetic Empire to the West, who seek to cleanse them and usurp Vlad from his rightful seat as an elect account. Isabella is of course the love of Vlad, but where he has a focus on attacking with himself and regular troops, Isabella has a much stronger affinity for vampire heroes, which she can provide massive buffs to and field many at a time. Depending which of Vlad and Isabella you pick, the other will also become a legendary hero for the faction, so you can always keep them together. And finally, we have the male man himself, Helmand Gorst. Now out in his own leading an entirely new faction, his faction is an undead powerhouse with a ton of zombie capacity, replenishment and poison damage.
The newly reworked Warriors of Chaos have gone from a bottom tier faction to a force to be reckoned with. Their new mechanics allow them to set up bases across the map in dark fortresses to give them respite when needed as well as recruitment and more. The Chaos Gifts can grant them a multitude of buffs and bonuses depending on who you dedicate yourself to. You can also recruit from a massive roster of units from across the branches of Chaos, soon to be expanding even further with the Champions of Chaos DLC, which yes, I can't show you just yet, but will be coming next week. Their roster is extremely powerful with frontline units ranging from petty marauders all the way up to aspiring POG champions as well as many monsters to crush the forces of order, or whoever you want really. We have 8 lords to show you today, and while I can't show you the Champions of Chaos in-game, we do know their faction mechanics and starting locations, so I can make some educated guesses about their playstyle. The first is Arkham and the Everchosen. He's the true undivided Warrior of Chaos, and is able to use this to net himself units and boons from the entire Pantheon. Colic Sun Eater is next up, and he is a big lad. He's the mightiest of the Dragon Ogres, and can make better use of them than any other Lord, and take the already strong units to being super duper strong. Sigi, the sensational servant of Slanesh, surely should seek to spread the salacious Lord's scent anywhere he strides. His speed, style, and silky hair make him a Lord not easily forgotten. Azazel is our Slaneshi champion, and as such, is another seduction specialist, with his ability to get factions of man neutral and even on side if he works hard enough, though we know they'd rather be under him. As vassals, not anything else. Festus is of course representing Nurgle and as such absolutely adores plagues and will be spreading them as much as possible to reap some massive rewards. Village the Cursling, the Seench Champion, has many tricks up his sleeves to reap massive amounts of souls, experience and of course magic. And Valkyr is of course here for Khorne and will be able to tear across the map in a single turn as long as you keep fighting and winning, but let me tell you, it's going to be easy to do plenty of that. And finally we have Belakor the Dark Master. He can corrupt even the most resolute humans chaos after beating them in battle or targeting them with heroes, slowly corrupting them to chaos just like Yuri slash Daniel. Giant enemy tree. We can't sleep yet. We must get clear of this place. And our final faction is the Wood Elves, and another one that was once weak and is now a powerhouse. The Wood Elves play a little bit differently to most factions. Instead of seeking to take every settlement they can, they only really care about magical forests, which are spread throughout the map and can be occupied and awakened to unlock powerful effects for your faction and slowly heal the Oak of Ages. To make navigating the world easier, these forests are all connected by an ancient network of routes that allow them to travel instantly between forests as well as shorter distances over impassable terrain. Their roster is a bit of a weird one, with a ton of ranged skirmishing units, alongside very fast cavalry, and a healthy dose of monsters and forest creatures. Our first legendary lord is Orion, the true king of Athaloran. Of all the hunters in the Wood Elves, none match his ability to track down his prey and inspire all others around him to do the same. Though who is next up, and as a tree lord, he's less bothered with the thrill of the hunt, and more interested in protecting the forest and making the most of tree spirit units while he's doing it. The Sisters of Twilight start far from the Oak of Ages, but their mission remains the same. Their special relationship with Master Smith Daith grants them several powerful items and effects, and their affinity for the skies buffs other flies in their faction significantly. And our final legendary lord in this behemoth list is Draika. She's not like other Wood Elves since she doesn't start in control of the Oak of Ages, and doesn't even get on well with the other tree huggers. She prefers to stick to forest spirits and beasties to get things done. And that is every single lord in every single faction in Immortal Empires. I hope this helps you pick who you want to play first, let me know your choice in the comments below, but if you want some last minute recommendations from me for some easy lords to get you started, you can't go wrong with Cal Franz or Tyrion if this is your first soiree into fantasy total war. This video took a massive amount of time to put together, so I really really hope it was enjoyable and or useful to you. If it was, then consider leaving a like and maybe even subscribing, hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year, so I really would appreciate the assist. One last thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, really does help support the channel, and if you want to help support it yourself, you can become a YouTube member or a Patreon on the Patreon. Doing so gets you all sorts of early access behind the scenes to videos, increased voting power, discounts on merch, and of course, shout outs at the end of every single video. Big thanks to Henry Tucker for his support at the Officer's Tier, and a thank you to every single supporter at every tier, really do appreciate it. One final thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Dumders, and I will see you next turn.